Good morning. Amen. Amen. Uh, so my name's is Leke, as, as Tony said. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, it, it's 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 incredible to just speak before you. I became a Christian in Daytona Beach, Florida, and then I moved here uh, to Broward. My mom lives in Coral Springs, and so did my sister. So it was, it's really cool. And uh, then I moved to Miami, and I moved to Miami because I wanted to go into the mission field. Uh, to Brazil, and I had to practice my Portuguese. So uh, FIU, which is in Miami, has a good Portuguese program, and that's why I went there, uh, to practice my Portuguese. So uh, today, you you could turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. And I do love the encouragement. I love the amens, the hallelujah, Uh, all that. So 1 Timothy chapter 4. Today we're going to be talking about Jesus the encourager. What does it look like? What does it mean to be an encourager? And and our focus is training. When we think about really training to be more and more like Jesus. Uh, For those who don't know me, I mean, I, I, I was born in Japan. So I'm a black and Asian man, yes. Blasian, baby. Black and knees. I, uh, I, I was reached out to by Zach Conroy. A bunch of you may know Zach Conroy. And uh, he reached out to one of my teammates. I was playing basketball in Daytona Beach. And one of my teammates, Will Neighbor, uh, he, was, he was from England. And, and Zach reached out to him and said, bro, would you like to come out to a, a Bible discussion? And he's like, no, mate. <laughs> but you know, Leke right there would love that. <laughs> I know my English accent was terrible, but thanks for the encouragement. <laughs> but, but in all seriousness, Zach came up to me and he's like, hey, are you Leke? I was like, yo, how do you know my name? It was good. And you know, I, I came out to the Bible talk and I was just so moved by what the scripture said. And I thought I knew what it meant to be a true Christian until I sat down and studied the Bible. I was moved by what the Word of God said when I studied it. I remember we talked about being a disciple. And I thought, man, what does that look like for me? And thinking about being a disciple is someone that looks like their teacher. And I already played basketball, so I knew what it meant to train. I knew what it meant to really think through and set goals to achieve a goal. And I thought, wow, I could do that for God. I could become someone who trains to be like Jesus. And this is what 1 Timothy chapter 4, in verse 7 here, it says, have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. I remember reading this and thinking, wow, now I can train to be like God. Like, I can truly train to be like Jesus. And I want to encourage you this year, what are you training to be more like Jesus in? You know, each year, people make their... uh, Every January, people say, I'm going back to the gym. The word train here is actually the word gymnazo, the word gym. And I encourage all of us in here to go to the gym spiritually, to really think about, man, what do I want to be more like Jesus in this year? Do you have a plan? Do you have goals? In what area? And a couple of years ago, I thought, man, I just want to set a goal each year to be more and more like Jesus. And this year, it's being unashamed. I want to be unashamed. I want to be unashamed about how I am and who I am. I want to be unashamed about Jesus. I want to be unashamed about being vulnerable. I grew up playing basketball. Coaches used to scream in my face to be like, Coach, you know, that hurt my feelings. (laughs) But I want to be unashamed and be like, Coach, that hurt, but I understand. Like, I I just want to be unashamed. I don't want to hold back anymore. 
So let's look at what it means to train to be more and more like Jesus. What's the area for your life in which you're seeking to train to be more like Jesus? Let's look at Luke chapter 6. Luke 6. You know, my goal is to stir your hearts to train to be like Jesus and survey the scriptures here. We're going to look at Luke chapter 6, and then we're going to look through Luke chapter 7. And the area in which we're going to look is Jesus and how he's an encourager. In 2015, I thought, man, I just want to like walk in the room and just look at people differently. Like just look at someone and be like, oh, man, you're awesome. And they truly feel that. I I thought, man, for the entire year, I'm going to focus on being an encourager, someone who gives my heart to people. And I sought to do that, and I thought, wow, now I'm reading the scriptures thinking, in what ways did Jesus encourage people? So we're going to look at that. But in Luke 6, in verse 4, you guys with me? I need some hallelujahs. Great. Luke 6, in verse 40, it says, The student is not above the teacher. But everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. Wow. So this passage says that you, that I, can be like Jesus. Sometimes I hear Christians say, you know, well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not Jesus. And I think, then what does it mean to be a disciple? What does discipleship mean to you? Doesn't it mean for us to train and to strive to be like our teacher? It says everyone who is fully trained will be like Jesus. I hope we believe that. And I hope we see that through Jesus being the encourager in Luke chapter 7. Let's read here. And we're going to use the Bible today. Uh, I I may not use as much PowerPoint uh, today. So we're going to flip our Bibles and swipe. Uh, So we're going to read through Luke chapter 7. I hope you're ready. Amen. Luke 7 and verse 1, it says, When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he answered Capernaum. Then a a centurion servant whom his master valued highly was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When he came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, this man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. You know, we're going to stop right there and just, there are stories that I read in the Bible and I feel like, oh, I've already heard this. You know, and, and I heard from a minister, his name's Keith Winship. He's like, man, when you read the Bible, think about what's happening. Think through the scene. If Jesus is walking on the sand, think about how the sand would just flow from his feet. Like, think through it. And I remember several years ago, uh, I was at a campus training program with a bunch of college students, and they're fired up. And I got a text message, your uncle passed away. And I was shook. I was like, And I thought, man, I knew my uncle was sick, like he had cancer, but I didn't know it was, it ameliorated just so quickly. And wow, this is what's happening. This is the scene that this guy is about to die. And Jesus is so willing to go. You know, Jesus is willing to help you wherever you're at. Jesus is willing to go to you. Jesus is willing. I hope as we read the passages where we see the scriptures and we're like, oh, Jesus is willing to go to where I'm at. As we keep reading here, verse 6, so Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I deserve to have you come under my roof. This is, that is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you, but say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. And that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. 
When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. You know, the centurion here, he is clear about who has the authority. He's very clear. He says, you know, I'm a man under authority. And my soldiers, they listen to me. I say, go. And he goes. And that one, come. And he comes. Jesus, just say the word. And what does Jesus do? Jesus is moved. He says, what? In all of Israel, this centurion has the greatest faith. The first point here is encourage God by having faith in God. Encourage God by having faith in God. This centurion displayed his immense faith in Jesus. And you know what Jesus does? Turns to the crowd and he says, Guys, this guy has amazing faith. This in turn, he understands my authority. I haven't found such great faith. He said, just say the word. Imagine Jesus saying this to you. You know, you can encourage God every single day by having great faith. You can encourage God. Imagine Jesus in heaven, just so excited, like, oh, Look at that, sister. Angels come along. <laughs> She's amazing. We can encourage God by having great faith in God, by trusting God. I remember playing basketball, and I threw an alley-oop to my friend, and he caught the ball, threw it around. He did a windmill and dunked it. People were amazed. Some kid was doing the nene. <laughs> and, like... I saw someone doing the running man. People were amazed. They were like, no way. Here in this passage, it says Jesus was amazed at this man's faith. You know, there are a few times in the Bible where Jesus is amazed. Jesus is amazed by great faith. And Jesus is also amazed by a great lack of faith. Sometimes I see Christians thinking, should I be faithful or unfaithful? And we go kind of back and forth like, oh, this, this decision, should I be faithful to God or unfaithful to God? And where in Jeremiah it says, you know, faithless Israel is more righteous than unfaithful Judah. Faithlessness is better than unfaithfulness. So stand on faith but don't just stay in this position of faithlessness. No, guys, let's continue to increase in our faith. You can encourage God by having great faith in God. You can encourage God every single day by proclaiming, God, yes, I'm going to trust you. You know, if our sentences change from, oh, I don't know if this is possible, to God, this is a difficult situation. This is hard. But I trust you. God, I know I'm going through this, and I, people probably don't really understand. But I trust you. Where your speech is one of, ah, oh, this is, I need, this is tough. But God, I trust you. You can encourage God by having great faith in God, by trusting in God. And this is what Jesus does. He lifts you up. Let's continue to read here. We're looking uh, Luke chapter 7 in verse 18. Point number two. Point number two. Encourage God by trusting in his word. Encourage God by trusting in his word. And this is Jesus, the encourager, in verse 18. John's disciples, Luke 7, 18. John's disciples told him about all these things. Calling two of them, he sent them to the Lord to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? 
When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, all those pimples away. The deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Now we stop here and we think, wow, John the Baptist, so he sends his messengers, and was John the Baptist doubting? We're not sure. We're not sure if it's John the Baptist thinking, man, is this, is this the one? Is he the Messiah? Or if he was sending his messengers so that they can understand, ooh, the Messiah is fulfilling what he was supposed to do. Because the Messiah was supposed to heal and bring light to those in darkness. Mark, Matthew chapter 4, right? And we see here that Jesus tells them, this is what I've been doing. And he sends a word of encouragement to John. He's like, look, I'm healing. I'm doing all these things. Go tell John. Go send a word of encouragement to John. Is that you? Do you send words of encouragement to other people? Are you training to be like Jesus in this way? Sending words of encouragement. And that's not even it. Let's keep reading here. In verse 24, after John's messengers left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. Jesus, are you going to encourage John? Yes, yes, he is. Let's read. What did you go out to... What did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No. Those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in first world countries. I mean, sorry, in palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. I will send my messengers ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. So what does Jesus do? As these messengers leave, then he turns to the crowd again. And what does he do? He lifts John the Baptist up. You know, sometimes when people leave the scene, sometimes people gossip instead of sending words of encouragement to those that before them. It's so easy to get mixed up in what is going on in the culture that we start becoming gossips. You know, the word gossip in the Greek is a whisperer. Someone who, behind someone's back, isn't courageous enough to say it to them, so... But no, that's not Jesus. Jesus turns around and encourages John the Baptist. He's like, what did you go out to see in the wilderness? Just, just a normal man? No, no. A prophet? Oh, greater. What did you go out to see? Malachi chapter 3. You went out to see this man who's preparing the way. Jesus is an encourager. I remember studying this and looking through Luke 7, and I was like, oh, I want to train to be like this. Oh, I want to be like Jesus in this way. I'm a disciple. That's what disciples do. And I thought, man, this is amazing. Jesus is encouraging here. And here's the thing. This isn't even the greatest part of this pericope, this area. Let's keep reading. What, what goes on? Verse 27. This is the one about whom it is written. I will send my messengers ahead of you who prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Who is Jesus encouraging now? Us. Wow! Jesus is encouraging you, and he's encouraging me. Oh, 
over it. Like, Jesus wants to lift you up. You know, sometimes when we listen to the Word of God, do we listen to the Word of God with conviction and hope, with, filled with encouragement, or do we see Jesus' words with a lens of sadness and guilt? No! Jesus says here, clearly, you're great. You should wake up thinking, you know what? I'm pretty great. I remember there was a sister I preached and I said, you know, God is only awesome. Only God is awesome. And then she said, you know, God is awesome, but he's given you his Holy Spirit. So because you have the Spirit, you're awesome too. And I was like, amen, sister. (laughs) But we found it. We found it here. Jesus is saying those even in the 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 least in the kingdom of God, is greater than the greatest man. You know those Dos Akis commercials? This is the greatest man because this, 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 is that. That's Jesus talking about you. We found it. Jesus sees you as awesome. Why do I say this? Because so many people are dealing with so many identity issues. Nowadays, like the, the millennial generation Seriously, the millennial generation is the generation that suicide rates have increased. I've been preaching the most that I've ever preached on Genesis 1 to Genesis 2. Just saying, God created you in his image. God sees you as awesome. You know when he says, Every, like, this is good? He says, I, it's like a euphemism for I love it. God sees you as awesome. But you have to trust in what he's telling you about you. God wants to encourage you, but you must trust what he actually says about you. And as you read the Bible, Romans 15 says that the scriptures are written to give us hope and encouragement. As you have your quiet times, do you read thinking, oh, I'm excited to just see what what else God is going to say about me? Like, I'm excited to see what God is going to say. Guys, let's turn around and continue to encourage people. In our lives, let's, let's just walk through the room and think, wow, I want to encourage this person. Let's have a lens in which we see Jesus just seeking to encourage people. How does this work practically? If you're a husband, husbands, are you encouraging your wives? Easy for me to say, right? I'm not married. Like, wives, are you encouraging your husbands? Ephesians 5 says, with respect. Are you, like, saying, you know, I don't know what married people say. <laughs> like, honey, you look like, mm. Or wives, are you like, baby boo? <laughs> or for the Hispanics, papi. I don't know, but are you filled with encouragement? And how about if you're single? Just, you know, sister, you're beautiful in the Lord. <laughs> like, we should just, I'm serious, amen. But this is what God says about us, and we should take it and be like, man, I want to go out and encourage. This is what we're training for. We're training to be like this guy, Jesus. This is awesome. Jesus turns around and says, the greatest in the kingdom are in the Broward Church. Greater than John the Baptist. Put that on your resume. Put your name and then say, greater than John the Baptist. (laughs) That's you. I encourage you to leave here with great encouragement. Knowing that, man, when I read my Bible, God wants to lift me up. As I walk, my identity is in Christ. It's not in what I do or who who people say that I... No, it's in Jesus. And that we leave here knowing that Jesus is out to encourage us. Let's keep reading here. In verse 29, it says, All the people, even the tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' words, acknowledged that God's way was right. 
because they had been baptized by John. But the Pharisees and the experts in the law rejected God's purpose for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. Jesus went on to say, To what then can I compare the people of this generation? What are they like? They're like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to each other, We played the pipe for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not cry. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and you say, Here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by all her children. You know, if you're not in the kingdom today, if you're not in if you're not a Christian today, don't allow God's word to hit your heart where we, we sing the songs of come to God, but it just bounces off your heart. Where you say, yes, God's way is right, but you don't commit to Jesus. You want to be great, greater than John the Baptist? Enter into his kingdom. If you want to be great, if you want to follow this man, Jesus, commit fully to trusting him and his word. Last point here. You guys with me? Amen. Amen. Last point. Encourage God by encouraging others in view of God's grace. Encourage God by encouraging others in view of God's grace. Let's read here Luke 7 and verse 36. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the, Pharisees, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she's a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then, turned, then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, ah, oh, Jesus, are you going to encourage someone else? Yes, he is. Verse 44, then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown, but whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. You know, Jesus here, he pulls Simon, tells him a little parable and says, you see this woman? Guys, that's what we should do to each other. Where we're able to say, man, that brother, bro, he went through that. That was tough, but he's faithful to God. Man, that sister, I don't even know how she went through that. But she's faithful. In view of God's grace, in view of what we've been forgiven with, we should love much and be encouragers to those in lowly places. Let's not leave here and not seek to be like Jesus in this way. Let's understand God has given me so much grace. Truly, I wake up almost every single day and I'm like so happy that the Broward Church gave so that I could become a Christian. 
My sister became a Christian right after that. And, and I, yes, I became a Christian first and I reached out to my sister, amen. And, and I reached out to her and I saw her life before she was a Christian and then she became a Christian. She was in a low place. She became a Christian. And then I saw her date pure in the kingdom. That's what we do, we date pure in the kingdom. And I saw at her wedding, her first kiss. We had, we had friends who said, man, that's, that's my goal. I'm so, so happy that I'm saved. I'm like filled with joy because of God's grace. I don't want to look at people and think, oh, you're not good enough. I don't want to be the Pharisee in this story. I want to be like Jesus in this story where we're able to lift each other up. Guys, what are you training to be more like Jesus in this year? What's your plan? I hope, just like Jesus is an encourager, we're planning and we're training to be more like Jesus in some way. Guys, I love you so much. I pray that we continue to encourage God by our faith, by his word, and by his grace. Amen.